members of the committee, we are now live. Guess it helps if I take myself off mute. The meeting is now called to order. Uh, this uh, special committee of the whole, I'll ask everyone to rise as you are able for reading of the invocation. As we come together today, we recognize the great responsibilities laid upon us. Our council will always strive to understand the needs of the people we serve and to use power wisely and well. Our purpose is to establish and maintain a city of prosperity and righteousness where freedom prevails and where justice rules. Let us also not forget those who served our community and who are no longer with us so that we can continue to do the work we must in their memory. Has roll call been taken, Mr. Clerk? Through the chair, roll call has been taken. Thank you. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Uh, there's one delegation on tonight's agenda. Please note delegations will have 10 minutes inclusive of questions of members. In keeping with procedural bylaw 1562, please ensure all comments are directly related to the matter before the committee. Is Peter Shear here? <laughs> There he is. Okay, Peter, you have 10 minutes. Go ahead. You're on mute. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, I just do wanted to speak to this report uh, about the governance for the, the council, council for the city of Brantford. I read the report by Watson and Associates. Um, on the first page of the executive summary, it states that the phase one will include uh, a review of council composition and employment status. Uh, once council has decided on the recommendations, you will move into phase two. Uh, the primary purpose of phase one is to prepare council to make decisions with respect to and, and then list five criteria to consider. I just wanted to read the five points um, that they may not, that may not have the documents um, how many councillors are are appropriate whether councillors should be continue to be elected in wards or citywide if uh, so how many councillors should be elected in a ward the number of wards in the city whether the city would benefit from having councillors who could devote themselves full-time to their council responsibilities or remain part-time it states that stakeholders and community engagement is an important component of this review uh, I've been hearing this cliche from the council uh, um, up for a lot from particular council recently. Um, I just wanted to examine that statement. This particular council really doesn't have a very good track record when it comes to uh, uh, community involvement and case in point is uh, with the sale of Airedale. Uh, council didn't reach, reach Mr. out. Mr. Shear, could you stay on topic, please? This is on topic. I'm, I'm talking about um, governance and responsibility. It didn't even, did you, you didn't reach out to the people at Airedale, you sprung it on the, on the public through a resolution um, and you know the rest of it. So let's examine the study that's being done now. There are 102,159 people in Brantford according to the 2017 study. This study was only done online. Uh, 1,355 people were aware of the review or 0.013% of the population. 635 people were informed by either viewing project pages, downloading materials, or, or six narrative content videos. So again, online. Of the 582 visitors that vi viewed the survey, 192 or 0.00188% of the population engaged and completed it. In the report, it stated 33%, which is excellent for the engagement topic. And these are the consultant's words, not mine. So they believe that 0.0018% of the population responding is excellent. I have noticed in the, in the article on the paper uh, that we were quoting percentages like 52% of the respondents said they wanted the number of counselors to stay the same. But what they didn't tell you was 52% of how many? 52% of 192, which is 92. 92 people. I don't understand why you would leave that number out. I think it's a pretty important piece of the equation. 
There are four survey questions. What number of councillors do you prefer for the city? 41 of the 92 said smaller than 10. 101 said keep it the same. 31 said larger than 10. 19 said they don't know. That's out of the 192. And your second one, in your view, which way of electing councillors do you think makes the most sense? 80 were, 81 were for the ward system, 57 were councillors at large, and 46, they, did, they were mixed. So that's more than half of the 192. Um, there was a large number uh, that, that want at large and were mixed. Uh, number three, in your view, how many councillors should be elected for each ward? 51 people said one, 84 said greater than one, 31 not in favor of ward, uh, elections, six said it doesn't matter. Four not sure, 16 were other. Your fourth question was how should the role of council be structured? 90 said part-time, 82 said full-time, seven said it doesn't matter, 13 said not sure. And then the recommendation came back, the city, the city of Brantford should continue to use the ward system. Interviews with council, councillors indicated a great deal of support for a continuation of the ward system. For this recommendation, what does a, I don't understand what, a, I don't know the value of a great deal. I don't understand why they didn't say four councillors wanted it this way, you know, it, it just didn't make any sense when we were talking about numbers before. This has been in place since the 1930s. Interviews with councillor and staff indicated a general level of satisfaction with the existing system. And here are my thoughts regarding this report. First of all, this survey was done in three weeks online. There was a minimal amount of exposure. We, had, uh, we have an aging population in Brantford, a population that, that a lot do not use electronic devices, so they are not on social media. A sample of 192 taxpayers is not a relative sample with a total population of over 100,000. The project structure was initially slated to start in April 2020, but was sidelined because of the pandemic. I don't understand why you would bring it in the middle of the pandemic in November. It states that the report was normally there would be a public engagement phase involving town hall meetings, open houses, and other face-to-face -face interaction. That wasn't happen That did, hasn't happened since 2016. And if that's the intent of the study, it shouldn't have been done until we were we could do it properly, uh, just like everything else that we're trying to do with this COVID. Uh, it says the report, the governance review has reached an, an, an important milestone. In my opinion, this important milestone is being handled as poorly as the KPMG report and the Airedale sham. It does, it does state that this form of election dates back to the 1930s. Well, this is 2021 and it's time for a change. As I stated before, decades before this format seemed to work, but this term of office has changed all that. There's no transparency, no community involvement. I don't care how many times councillors say on TV that that doesn't make it true. In my opinion, some members of council are hiding in their respected wards, making critical, unpopular decisions for the city and taxpayers outside their wards because they know there are no consequences. They, they keep their ward happy so they can get reelected and the rest of the city suffers collateral damage. This may sound harsh, you created this monster. You have created so much animosity in the city and it seems and it needs to stop. You keep poking the bear, the bear is gonna wake up. In my opinion, you have taken the voice of the taxpayers. Mr. Chair, please keep your comments respectful. Well, that was pretty respectful. In my opinion, you have taken the voice of the taxpayers, pushing things through under the radar, forming a code of conduct that muzzles the public. Over the past few decades- Mr. Chair, if you're not gonna be respectful, we're gonna cut you off here. Why am, what, what was disrespectful of that? I have, a, I have a voice. You work for me, I'm talking to you. And when you disrespect me, then <laughs> I, it makes me want to cut you off and say you're done. You do it every Tuesday night, but there's no repercussions for what you say. I'm just telling you what my thoughts are about this report and what the past history has shown. Well, you have two minutes left. Well, I originally asked for an extension, but that didn't get brought up, did it? We're following our procedures. Yeah, but you were supposed to be asked to get it extended, but that didn't happen.
we only vote for two two councillors and uh, when all 11 make decisions for the city. In my opinion, at the end of the four year term, we should be able to reflect over that term and come to our own conclusions as to who on that board made effective and positive decisions for the future of our city. Don't get me wrong, we're not going to agree with all decisions made by council, but we should be able to express our opinion during the voting process. That is what democracy is all about councillors in their respected wards because they know they are untouchable by the majority of the voters is not democracy. There are so many contentious issues that I cannot name. If council can sit here tonight and believe that using a survey that is made up of 192 taxpayers or 0.0182 percentage of the constituents and believe that this was done fairly and in the best interest of the community, then we're in trouble. And it proves my point that council does not really want the input from the taxpayers. And if, if I could, I'd, I'd like someone to uh, let me know how much that this act, this um, survey cost the city through uh, uh, Watson. That's all I have. Any questions? We have 30 seconds left. Councilman Curry, you're up. Uh, Mr. Shear, thank you for attending today. I'm sorry you didn't understand much of what was uh, in the report. You said that a number of times. Um, are you saying that uh, the online petition that you uh, created to point towards the election of councillors at large with a respondent total of 50 was a more effective means of communicating with the community? Well, let's stay on point here, councillor. What's that got to do with this report? You don't wanna answer questions, Mr. Shear. we can say goodbye. Um, so you, you're advocating clearly election at large, is that correct? Correct. So you were a candidate in uh, 2018, uh, ran in the second ward, um, you spent a considerable amount of money. Point of uh, order. Would you be prepared to spend five times as much and do five times as much canvassing no, in the next no, no, period? Sure. Sure. Time is up. Thank you. The answer is yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shear. Your, your time is up. We'll move on now. Um, at this time, members of the committee, we have a presentation. If there are no objections from the committee, I'll allow the presentation time to be extended. Are there any objections? Okay, I see objections. So we'll stay with procedure of 10 minutes. Uh, I would call upon Tanya Daniels, city clerk, uh, director of clerk services and Eric Carvin of Watson and Associate uh, in association with Sarah Refuse of ICA Associates Dr. Robert J. Williams and Dr. David Siegel, please commence your presentation. Good evening, Chair Martin and committee members. I'm Tanya Daniels, the City Clerk and Director of Clerk Services. Before you tonight is a report that provides information merging on three topics. The first and largest component being the City Governance and Employment Status Review Phase 1 report, which will be overviewed in the presentation by our consultants. The other topics included the staff report, uh, which included preliminary remuneration information, which HR staff were here to answer questions on, and an update on the KPMG service delivery report. With that, thank you for your time tonight, and I'll turn it over to the consultants. Thank you, uh, Clerk, and, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to work through this presentation with our 10-minute uh, time limit in mind. My name is Robert Williams. I'm one of the members of this team. I'll ask the clerk to move on to uh, slide two, please. Uh, just a quick overview. That is the introduction to us. We are at the end here of phase one, and this uh, is a set of, of uh, topics that we've been asked to consider uh, in the light of, of uh, the current uh, arrangements within the city of Brantford. We're coming toward uh, the end of that through this discussion and your decision next week. We will move on here to phase two, which will evaluate the, pre uh, the recommendations and present recommendations to you rather around ward boundaries for the city of Brantford uh, ahead of the 2022 election. Uh, if I move on uh, to uh, the next slide, uh, the, actually the next two slides, uh, I think the, the following one is uh, one you would be quite familiar with. The current structure, 11 members of council, the mayor elected at large, 10 councillors elected in five wards with two councillor councillors per ward. The next slide basically is, is providing some context. Why are we doing this review now? Uh, and as has already been pointed out, there have been no major changes in Brantford's electoral structure since the mid 
1930s, five wards each electing two councillors. Uh, in our view, it's important to at least reconsider whether that is still the right method, and if so, at least to have a rationale for maintaining that. We've also seen population growth since 2013. The population now estimate is about 106,000, much larger than when the current wards were created. And the city, of course, has expanded its territory through lands annexed from the County of Brant. So population growth will continue over the next uh, decade. And in fact, looking at uh, out to 2051, as many as 165,000 people. And the next election is on in October 22. I'm going to ask David Siegel to pick up the discussion from here, please. Can't hear you, Dave. Uh, if, if we're having a technical issue, then I'll, I'll just carry on for the moment. Um, the uh, process that we did set up uh, was intended to provide an opportunity for the community to learn about the process, to learn about some of the issues, and to take place within the, the province-wide shutdown and, and its aftermath. So the first public consultation opportunities were done through a series of online tools that are still available on the website. These are uh, practices that are consistent with principles outlined in the city's community involvement framework that is based on an inclusive open process in which no specific outcomes are predetermined. Uh, we made every effort to invite the community to participate in that. And uh, we've reported on that in the summary report that you've seen. The next slide, uh, uh, sorry, the, there's the summary of that that again you can you can check uh, through the main report and through the uh, this document which will be posted uh, later on. The next slide is basically looking at the sequence of decisions that we need to look at, and they they can be separated out. But you're looking at should the size of the council change, should the city continue to be uh, use wards or not. If not, then we move on to the question of employment status. If there are to be wards, how many wards? One member, two member, uh, that is also part of the, the uh, pattern. And then eventually, uh, if wards are maintained, a ward boundary review. Uh, when we move on then to the question of council composition. Okay, I think I've resolved. There. You're ready, okay, please jump in, David, thank oh. you. Um, one of the questions we were asked to look at was the size of council. And this is covered in the Municipal Act, as we talk about on the next uh, slide, but council can make the decision, but it's a very broad uh, scope. You have to have at least four councillors, but there's no maximum and there's no principles or guidelines. We provided on the next slide, we provided a comparison with comparable single tier municipalities that indicated that uh, Brantford is really pretty much uh, very similar to the comparator municipalities that, that we used. And we used all of the single tier municipalities in the 75,000 to $200,000 population. The next slide shows uh, some considerations that council should think about in terms of choosing the sites of uh, council. So if we can go to the next slide, um, we'll uh, see there that the more councillors you have, the more opportunity there is for citizen access, the more possibility there is for diversity on council for equity seeking groups to be able to serve on council. However, the downside of that uh, is that there uh, too many councillors can slow down the decision making process and make it more complicated. A larger council also increases the uh, cost of compensation uh, for councillors and the costs associated with council. That's not a, a huge cost, but it is there. Um, if you have fewer councillors, that's basically the opposite of what I was just uh, talking about. So if we go to the next slide, it shows you the responses of the uh, uh, 
uh, people who participated in the survey. Um, and from there, we'll go to the next question, which is ward versus at-large election. And I'll go back to Robert Williams for this. Thank you, David. Uh, I think uh, the general picture of what the, the two systems are about are summarized here. An at-large system is one in which candidates run across the entire municipality. Voters choose from among all candidates. And it's important to note that at-large elections are much more common in smaller municipalities without major differences in, in terms of the composition of the city. Uh, and so uh, uh, that is not a pattern that is found in, in the municipalities in that previous chart. The ward system, of course, is the system you have in, in Brantford and have had for a long time. The candidates, as we see on the next slide, run in a designated area of the city. Uh, and each ward ideally has roughly an equal population. Voters are entitled to vote only for candidates who run in that ward. This again is a pattern found in medium and larger municipalities where there's some internal geographic differences. And that uh, I think uh, would, would describe Brantford. The, the next slide offers a very brief comparison of some of the attributes of the two systems uh, that, that uh, I think should be familiar, the candidates campaigning across the municipality in an at-large versus the ward uh, in the ward-based system, uh, issues of access and, and contact uh, related to the size of the uh, electorate. Uh, there are certainly implications for having representation for the entire municipality in an at-large system. And of course, campaigns require many, uh, much more resources and they, those are often more difficult for new candidates, the reverse of that in a award system. Moving on uh, from there to the question of the, the number of councillors per ward. Again, we did, uh, uh, we got some responses on that, which enter into uh, what comes up later on in the recommendations. They're not based strictly on this factor. David, over to you on uh, councillors per ward, please. Brantford has had two councillors per ward for a considerable period of time. What we heard in the survey is that people like the two member wards because they it increased their chances that they would be able to contact one councillor if the other councillor was unavailable. It also increased the chances that uh, they would be able to find a councillor who was sympathetic to their particular uh, uh, point of, of view. Um, so can we skip a couple of slides here? Um, the next one. Um, and the idea is that if we have a smaller number of wards, uh, then that is likely going to uh, make the wards larger and uh, make it more diverse, more difficult for councillors to represent. Uh, decrease citizen access, and it does have the benefit of decreasing the size of council, but it also makes it more difficult for councillors to be familiar with their war. Uh, the next slide shows the uh, responses uh, from uh, citizens, and you'll see that uh, a major a plurality of uh, respondents did favor greater than one, um, and there was some division there between uh, 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 some division that some people like one counselor per ward. So that's basically what we had to say about that issue of the number of counselors per ward. Um, let's go on to the next uh, issue and I'll turn this back to Robert. So the question of, of the role of a counselor, uh, is it a full-time or part-time position? The next slide summarizes some of the key questions that need to be considered in this situation certainly very clear in Brantford and a great many other municipalities that the role of a councillor is becoming a more time consuming and complex role. This is particularly the case in a one tier situation, a single tier municipality like Brantford. On the other hand, the legislation, the Municipal Act does not make any distinction between a part time and a full time councillor. A councillor is a councillor. That's all that's there. It's important to notice that only three municipalities in Ontario pay their uh, elected officials on a full-time basis, Toronto, Ottawa, and Hamilton. 
all other municipalities pay their counselors on the basis of the assumption that they are serving in that role on a part-time basis. There's some who believe that, that moving to a, a full-time compensation might attract higher quality candidates in the sense of people uh, who, who can devote their entire time to that work. And, and it, uh, it is, it's, it's not a definitive statement, but there's an expectation that the type of people who put themselves forward could change if it seemed to be a full-time position. And that's what that second last bullet bullet is. The council position should be available to all qualified residents and not be limited to only those people who can afford to do it um, on a part-time basis or can adapt their, their other, the rest of their life, if you will, to serving at a counselor. But again, this needs to be fair. If people are working full-time, they should be paid for full-time work. And that's, a, a, again, a perspective. We don't have a lot of cases to work on with only three, but there is a possibility that that could be uh, an important consideration. The next slide is just, again, a quick summary uh, of what are perceived to be advantages of the two systems or disadvantages. On the one hand, part-time counselors must have other employment or income uh, to, to maintain uh, their, their, their family and, and their life. And this tends to limit the, the candidates who can attend these meetings. Part-time also usually means meetings are at night, which of course can create additional costs to the municipality uh, because of greater staff need to work for evening meetings. Full-time counselors, again, the advantage is they can concentrate. That is their job. They can, can put their effort into that rather than shifting from work to council or back and forth. So that, that also that could mean more daytime meetings, uh, which uh, uh, would not hap have to happen if people were juggling other responsibilities. It may attract more candidates uh, with, if it's full-time, but again, there are higher costs to the municipality if counselors are paid at that full-time rate. And we're not in the discussion of, of determining what that might be if Brantford Council decides to move in that direction. So, Mr. Williams, you've, you've reached the end of your time. If you could wrap things up. Okay, I, I will let David uh, just walk very quickly through the three recommendations, one line at the top of each, and and I think um, uh, we can uh, we could stop there. I can do this very quickly. Uh, the three recommendations that we have are that the city of Brantford uh, should continue to use a ward system. The second recommendation is that the city of Brantford. Uh, should continue to use a system of two member wards. And the third recommendation is that counselors should continue to be compensated on a part-time basis. And that's, uh, uh, that summarizes the report that we presented. Thank you very much. Can I have a mover and a seconder to put item 5.1.1? Moved by Councillor Weaver, seconded by Councillor Wall. And questions, Councillor Weaver, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, could you explain, uh, Robert, first, thank you very much for the presentation and for, and for uh, coming today. Um, can you explain uh, to the viewing public, because I think the delegate was a little, little um, wasn't aware that any changes to an election structure, a municipality has, I think it's 18 months to, to do that before the next election. Is that, is that correct? I believe that's in the Municipal Act. Through you, Mr. Chair, the, the deadline for changes for the 2022 election is literally December uh, uh, 31st of the year before the election. So, so it's really the end of this year. So uh, any change needs to be implemented before the end of this year. But there is also within uh, the adoption process, the possibility of an appeal uh, to the local planning appeal tribunal. And that is a process that we've tried to build into this review so that in the event a change is made, the appeal period is 45 days. There would need to be a hearing held at that time and the tribunal would need to issue a decision by the end of this calendar year. So the deadline is, is the end of the year, but we need to have time to allow for that possibility. And uh, thank you for that. And um, is there an ability to appeal a, a non-decision? Uh, technically, no, in the sense that 
what is appealable is a bylaw to amend the boundaries of the wards. However, if there is a petition, again, all this would take time. If there's a petition to council that says, do whatever, <laughs> to, to, to have no wards, to not to adopt that, the, what's been adopted, uh, and council just determines not to act on the appeal, that could also be taken to LPAC. But that, again, there's a lengthy time period, fairly high threshold uh, to, to uh, bring uh, something like that to bear. Uh, and and the, the board would then have to hear reasons why council's decision was inappropriate. Okay, thank you for that. Um, could you explain to me why um, in Ontario anyway, we don't have term limits? I can't explain to you why we don't have term <laughs> limits. No, we don't have them anywhere in Canada. That is not a practice in the Canadian electoral system, just like other factors. Uh, for example, if you have wards, you don't have to live in the ward. Uh, some jurisdictions might make that rule. So no, I, I, can't, uh, I can't say why that was the case. I, I guess the ultimate time limit is uh, called a, an election. Uh, okay. And, and uh, those who can succeed will, will be able to stay in office. Those who can't uh, are removed. But no, I, I, I don't have an explanation for why there is no rule of that sort. I was hoping you could help me out because I get questions about that all the time and I don't know the answer either. So I was hoping you'd be able to shine some light, but uh, regardless, thank you very much for uh, taking the time with us tonight. Okay, happy to do that. Thank you, Councillor Wall, you're next, you have the floor. Great, thank you, Chair Martin. You're doing a great job, by the way. <laughs> Thanks for your presentation. Um, and I, I've read and reread the report. This one is a big deal to me because I made a big puff about it. I have a number of questions. Could you please go into more detail about an at-large system of governance? Happy to, and, and if David wants to join in too, I may, I may hand over part of it to him. But this basically when we have an at-large election, it's sometimes called a general vote. It means, if you will, the constituency is the whole city. There is one ward, it's the whole city. Every candidate who wishes to run files a nomination to run in that one big ward. They must, if they're to be elected, they are, need to finish ahead of other candidates who have also run across the entire city. Uh, I mean, that's the basic structure of it. I'm not sure what else you'd like to no, that was about. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna follow up with more questions, I promise. Okay. okay. Uh, I read in the report that there didn't seem to be, I'm so sorry about that. This is supposed to be on mute. I read in the report that there was sufficient evidence that showed that a ward system complemented by an at-large system, that that wasn't generally supported. Do you have any opinion on that? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to bring David in on that for a moment, but the, the fact is this is not a common practice. We've only been able to identify one municipality in Ontario that has some members of council elected at large and others elected at wards, if I follow your question. Uh, the and the only example of that is the city of Thunder Bay and that was an arrangement made at an amalgamation that happened now, what, 40 or more years ago. Fort William, Port Arthur brought together a single ward, uh, uh, sorry, a set of wards, but a, another layer of councillors elected at large. Uh, and I'm not sure whether David Siegel could can comment on, on that as well. If we're going yeah, in the right at, direction, at, I assume, Councillor. At one point, uh, most of the very large municipalities in Ontario had that arrangement and they had something called a board of control. Um, and the problem was that um, the, the, you, you then had councillors who were directly elected and some who were who were elected at large, I should say, and some were elected by wards. And there got to be a question, is there a hierarchy of these councillors? Well, there's not, but there tended to be concern about that. The boards of control were gradually eliminated. Um, most of them were eliminated in the 20th century. London was the last one uh, to be eliminated 10, 15 years ago. It just created an awkward situation around the council table between councillors who were elected at large and uh, and by ward. Okay, my next question 
he said amalgamation, so I'm going to say amalgamation, but I wanted to hear about the thought of that being something that happened. And then how would that even work? Would we be forced then to reevaluate the ward system and the councillor system at that point? We wouldn't have 20 councillors and two mayors. Well, I, I can talk I'm, a bit more. Please, sorry, David, I, I can go talk ahead. a bit more about what happened in Kingston in 98 when it was consolidated. And as a, you know, as a halfway measure between the city and the two townships, they decided to keep uh, this mixture of at large and uh, uh, ward uh, councillors. And they realized, I think just about the first meeting of the new council that uh, this was a mistake. But it was basically their agreement when as a part of their amalgamation, they agreed to do this. And then, as I say, they very quickly realized that uh, this was not going to work as well as they thought it was going to. Could I add, so, add to Councillor Wall's question? If, if you're talking about some kind of a, a merger amalgamation with City of Brantford and the county, I think I know what you're going. Basically, you're a new municipality. You've got to start all over again. You, as a new municipality, would need to decide how you wish to govern yourselves. And that would involve maybe having no wards, maybe having 10 wards, maybe having three wards. I don't know. That's not something that's a foregone conclusion because the legislation makes no reference to that whatsoever. The size of the council is not, is not determined by anyone other than the residents of the new municipality. Now, if the province stepped in and made you do that, then, then all bets are off. But, but that, that, you know, that's basically the province's decision. So it's not even in the hands of, of local residents. And oftentimes that can be a fairly arbitrary process. Uh, to determine how many seats go to which part of an amalgamated municipality. So again, it, if there was such a thing, and, and it's not part of our mandate, it's not part of what we've been asked to look at, if something like that happened, I go back to my first point, you're a new municipality, you start all over again. Okay, my final question is about administrative support for councillors with the, comparable, the comparative municipalities. So yes, most municipalities across the country or whatever the province had part-time counselors, but could you touch upon the support that those, those part-time counselors have? David, can you pick that up? Uh, in my experience, it's very unusual for part-time counselors to have uh, any sort of administrative assistance beyond just the kind of casual use of someone in the clerk's department or someone in another department to, you know, look at a particular memo or respond to a particular question or something like that. It's not typical that uh, part-time counselors would have any sort of dedicated uh, uh, support staff for them. Okay, thank you for your time. Okay, Councillor Vanderstel, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, David. And I think Eric's hiding somewhere, is he? Yes, he is. Yes. <laughs> As a server refuse, but <laughs> <laughs> good to see you again. Um, you, bet well, between the three of you, you must have gone through this process with various councils in Ontario or abroad, further abroad uh, a number of times. Um, have you ever been uh, given the additional mandate to ask questions uh, in your surveys uh, with regard to visible minorities and the percentage of women uh, on councils. Has, has ever, that ever been part of your structure of what you studied? I would have to say no. It's not, a, it's not an overt uh, part of a review of this kind. This is not a, this is not a project that, that lends itself to uh, bringing about certain kinds of results, if I can put it that way. Uh, we base, as we would talk about if we hadn't run out of time, uh, part two is about designing wards that are based on the ge geography, population, distribution of the city, not necessarily who those people are, but where they live and, and how, the, how the numbers play out. And, and I think it's fair to say that there is no definitive answer to a, a particular system of government, of, of an elections leading to a, a particular kind of result. 
I, I, there are just not enough cases to be able to say, if you have, let's say, two member wards, you will often get a man and a woman, or you might get a young or an old. There's simply not enough cases to be able to say that one necessarily leads to the other. Oh, okay, well, um, arguably, yes, I, I can understand how you cannot glean data that you haven't asked for or that are probably- no, no, Not uh, that we didn't ask for it. It's just not, it's not, there is no evidence of that kind of co correlation across the province. Right, right. Um, I, I, want to, I want to phrase this carefully, Robert. I'm sorry okay. for my hesitation, but the average, uh, let's say for, for, uh, for women on council, the average is 31% across Canada. We're at 9%. Are there any structures whatsoever, electoral structures, that allow for a, a more equal representation of the population that you have experienced, that you've come across? I, again, I would not, I don't think we could make that connection. And we were asked this question in another context uh, about say two member wards. And I was able to point to a large number of municipalities where the proportion of women is much larger in single member wards. But that may happen to be the, the part of the province I live in. Uh, so it's, in other words, it's not the system that you use. It's to do with, with uh, those people who choose to become candidates and are successful in, in getting there. I don't think, again, we can definitively say it's because of one system or another. Not related, okay. Well, thank you very much, Robert. I appreciate your answers. Okay, thank you. Councilor McCurry, you're... Thank you, Chair. Um, gentlemen, good to sort of see you again. <laughs> Um, thanks for leading us through this um, exercise. I, uh, is it safe to assume that you conducted interviews with every single member of council? No, we did not. But we made the if it issued the invitation to all members of council. How many members participated? Uh, eleven. Uh, sorry, ten. Ten out of eleven. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, what's before us? If I could summarize it in a sentence, is um, it ain't broke, so don't fix it. And um, you probably can't do any better than what you've got currently in place. I, I, I'm not sure I would put the ladder there. There probably are some, some improvements, but you need mm -hmm. to be persuaded that they would be of benefit. And that's not our decision, that's yours. What right. we would be trying to do for you is to lay out based on the experience that, that David brings to this, that I bring to this, the experience in other municipalities around the questions we're asked, and, and our understanding of Brantford and its traditions about what things can be maintained, uh, but what things could in fact be, or could possibly be uh, improved with, with modifications. But uh, that, that uh, I, I would never say it's perfect. <laughs> so uh, we know that, that it uh, has, been in place for a long time. And part of this exercise, and I sort of uh, alluded to this earlier, is for you as council and the community that's willing to participate to step back and say, is this the best for us now? You're now no. a community of over 100,000 people. Is this still the best way to do it? And if so, why? Why do we believe that we don't need to change? Right, now there are, there are some people in the community that have already started campaigning uh, to change this to an elected at large system. Um, and if, if, I, if you'll bear with me a second, I wanna reach back into some of the comments that I think I read in the report. Um, one of the uh, comments that a citizen said was that if you're electing at large, that means that every candidate has to campaign throughout the entire city. And that may limit the access to a council seat to those uh, who have access to a lot of money and prevents folks with more meager uh, abilities to be able to conduct a winning campaign. Would you say that's maybe accurate? Can I ask David to start with that and I will join, jump, jump in well, in a moment. I, I mean, I think it's empirically the case that, uh, you know, if you're uh, campaigning uh, among a larger number of constituents, then you have to find, uh, you have more doors to knock on and you have uh, other types of campaign advertise paying to advertise in the media for example um and to, to get back to an earlier uh question 
this is something that can probably work against, um, uh, it, it works against um, in non-incumbents, people trying to upset incumbents. It can also probably work against people who don't have access to resources. And that might be uh, women sometimes feel that they don't have access to the same sort of uh, resources that men do, and it might be others, other might be minorities might feel that they don't have access to the same resources that uh, others do, and therefore they can't compete evenly in an at-large system. Now, would you also say that um, candidates whose, um, whose home neighborhoods may be low voter turnout neighborhoods might be disadvantaged in a citywide election as um, their supporters would be less numerous than those in wards where the turnout is far greater. Uh, and if I look back at the results of the last election, um, you can see that that would play out if, if, if the vote totals of our gang here were, uh, were looked at on a, on a citywide basis. So could you comment on that one, please? Well, of, well of course, I think it's, it's, go ahead, it's just a matter of the math. I mean, uh, if you live in an area where you can get a large number of votes relatively easily for whatever reason, uh, then you're at an advantage over somebody who lives in an area where he or she's not going to be able to get those number of votes. It's, it's, it's the math, you know. <laughs> yeah. And a part of it, though, is, is the question of how you would, uh, how you would campaign. Uh, and, and is it a face-to-face -face campaign? And that, that might uh, create advantages and disadvantages. Uh, getting access to people. When can you get out and campaign? If it's only, uh, if it's in the evening, uh, does that give you advantages? If you could go out in the daytime, it's hard to tell how that particular part would play out. Again, if you're going to run at large, you can't just stick in your own neighborhood. You've got to get out across the city and find a way to reach those other communities, those other neighborhoods. And, and again, that is a very large challenge for, for many individuals uh, and, and feeling comfortable knocking on, on doors in areas where you don't know anybody, those kinds of things might have a bearing on it. But I, I think it's fair to say in the few cases that, that I've, I've looked at this in a few cases in the past, and there's often a very interesting um, I'll call it a skewing, if you will. Those people who tend to be more successful often do come from certain parts of a city. Uh, and, and that probably relates to somewhat to what you're just talking about. Uh, and and it's, not a, it's not a broad distribution of representation, which again, in a, a ward system, it's saying this part of the city has a representative or two. They may not live there, but they've gone to those people and said, we believe we can represent you, so vote for us. When you're in the big pool, that's less likely. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much for guiding us through this. Okay. Councilor Carpenter, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a few questions. In, in your, your comments, you, meant, you said the phrase, some jurisdictions might make that a rule. So is there a flexibility in what rules a municipality may make under the Municipal Act as far as elections go? For example, you said that some jurisdictions might make a rule that you must live in the ward. Uh, no, I, I'm not sure that that's what I, if, I, if that's what you heard, then that's not what I meant to say. Okay. That has well, not been the case in Canada. Th there may be, I'm thinking perhaps of some, well, um, some uh, say American jurisdictions, but uh, term limits are not the case in Canada, uh, but I don't happen to know where that is, uh, where but else I, that might I be. I wasn't case. speaking of term limits, living in the ward. Oh, living in the ward. Again, I believe that is a, a requirement uh, in, in many American jurisdictions, maybe not at the municipal level, but in terms of other seats that you it's need not to a requirement. reside. Yeah, it's not in a requirement the, that we can make under the Municipal Act in Ontario. No, you cannot, that I'm aware of, you could not, or under the Municipal Elections Act, no. I don't fact, believe you could, you could make those know. kinds of rules, no. I don't believe we can make it clear they actually even live in the city. Well, no, you need to be an elector. You may not yeah, live you, in the city, yes. As yeah, long can, as you are qualified as an elector. You could own a business. You know, I've interviewed people in who, who are uh, the mayor of one municipality and live in another, but 
Uh, but normally, yes, it's it's a you resident. Can rental, yeah, you can own rental property in, in a city and run in that city and live somewhere else. Oh, yes. But again, that's up to the voters to decide whether they believe that's a, an appropriate way to, to get representation. Yeah. OK, uh, thank you. And the other one would be, uh, you know, I think it was touched on by Councillor Vanderstelt. And there isn't a, an ability for a municipality to say in a two ward system that one ward is a, is a, a female seat and one ward one of those in the ward is a male seat. And I would put that back under the Municipal Elections Act. I don't think you can establish qualifications beyond the ones that I've just talked about. An elector is an elector. A candidate is an elector. I don't believe uh, you have the jurisdiction to, to step beyond that and create a system uh, that might do that. Uh, I, at the municipal level, I don't doubt that that's the case. Maybe David has other perspectives on that. Uh, no, I, I mean, I think that would be seen as discriminatory to, uh, uh, to, to make that arrangement up front. Okay, uh, and the, uh, you, uh, you, you, I lost my train of thought there. You, you also mentioned, oh yes, uh, you talked about comparative municipalities in a report and you compared us with nine municipalities in the two ward system, but there was only three uh, of those that had the two ward system. Um, and yep. in, in a number were mixed, but there was only three that had that. Yes. Is that fair? Okay, um, now the other yep. question. I, I thought there were four, actually. I think there was the no, four. sorry, members. that's right. No, there are three that have two members and uh, four that have a single member. That's fourth right. was mixed. Uh, mixed. Yeah. It, now, when you, when you talk about the two-ward system having a better chance of someone being able to afford to run, in that case, uh, in, uh, in a five wards, would not 10 words on a ward and a one member system even give more greater ability for people to run because it'd be a smaller area and there'd be more affordability to actually run in, in those wards? I think what you're raising, Councillor, is that there's two interrelated questions. Uh, if, it's, if, it's, if there's a sense that 10 is the right number and you want to have two member wards, then the wards by definition are going to be one fifth of the city. If you're saying you want 10, and, you'd, and you, can, you could go with a one member per ward system, then the wards clearly would be smaller. It's hard to know which end to start at. If you want smaller wards that are easier to represent, then obviously a one member system would be the, the, the outcome of that. Yeah, so, I, was just, I was just trying to base the argument that you said is uh, instead of a city running at large, which yeah. would be difficult for some people to actually run in an election, the smaller ward, five wards would make it more accessible, but 10 wards would even make it more accessible than that. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I, 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 again, in, in, yeah. in general terms, that is what likely what could happen, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, seeing no further questions, I have a few. There was, I think it was Chatham, Kent in the report, they had some system where it was a different number of councillors per ward. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, again, that was a matter of an, al of an amalgamation. And Chatham, uh, the city of Chatham, became a part of Kent County, which added uh, about 11 or so uh, towns, townships, villages, and so forth. And uh, Chatham had always had a, uh, an at-large system of elections. So Chatham is what you see there that has that large number of members. I think it's six or seven. That is, there is a ward that is the former city of Chatham. Um, and the rest of the uh, county is uh, uh, represented by a kind of grouping of towns and townships with one or two uh, representatives. But so it's, you know, it's a lot a kind of things of... like that happen as a result of amalgamations. And that's been in, in place in uh, Chatham County for 20 years. So they're comfortable with it. Uh, it's a product of an amalgamation. I don't think anybody starting from scratch would say, you know, it's a good idea to have uh, different size wards in, uh, in a municipality, but it works well in Chatham County for historical reasons. <laughs> so it's kind of like a, a mini at-large at system in the, in the center of the donut. I mean, that's that's sort of the way to think about it. You've got a mini at-large system. Part of the city works that way and the others are, are in wards. I mean, it's still a ward, but it's electing six people. Sounds very un, un, unwieldy. But I guess if they can make it work, more power to them. 
Um, is that an example of a hybrid system? Uh, you talked about hybrid systems within your report. Technically, it's not because it is a ward. It is one of the wards in Chatham-Kent. It's just that it has a different number than the others, which is uh, one of my pet peeves. But the, but that it, it is not a hybrid system now. Thunder Bay is the only one uh, presently operating with, with that kind of a hybrid. And can you explain what that is? David, can you uh, pick up that one, please? Sure, I'll give it a try. It's, it's real yeah. complicated. But what happens in the election is that, uh, that there are seats that are identified as at large. And I think there are five seats that are identified as at large. And there are also wards. So when you're voting, you vote for a member from your ward, but you also have uh, the right to vote for these people who are running uh, at large. Um, so you've got some kind of two different kinds of votes that you can cast as a, uh, uh, as a uh, voter. Um, and again, I'd say the same thing I did about Chatham Kent. It, it's been there for 50 years uh, in Thunder Bay and it must work fine for them, um, but it's not the sort of thing that most people would uh, come up with uh, in some place that did not have the amalgamation history that uh, Port Arthur and Port William would have. Okay, that's, that's my questions. Uh, first time speakers, Councillor Slash, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just have one. When you have a, a hybrid system where you have wards and then you also have people being, or councillors being elected at large, is the remuneration the same? I can't say that I can speak to that directly. I, I'm not aware of how that is structured because part of that may also be whether they've created some additional role for those at large councillors. Uh, so I'm not sure that. Uh, that the, this pace uh, is, is differentiated. It, partly it's a matter of expectation, I suppose, what, what those councillors do, those at-large councillors do that a ward councillor doesn't do or vice versa. So uh, I, I don't have an answer to that uh, off, off, uh, uh, off the top of my head as to how that is, is played out. I don't know if David does. No, I, I don't know the answer to that. But there is only the one example in front of the day. I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Yeah. I guess the other one, what I would say is it, with the at-large um, option, um, it's no different than running a mayor's race because you're, you're running the entire city. And if you, if you look at history and you look at returns when, when the filings are made after an election, a typical mayor's race is about $25,000. Um, well, back in my day, it was last election, it was probably double that. And, and I understand that, but that, I think that was an anomaly. Uh, typically, it's twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars will get you into a, a race for mayor, and and that's that's citywide, and that also involves a couple of hundred uh, volunteers because you've got to get that stuff out, your your pamphlets and your literature and whatnot. That uh, it's very very expensive, and and I don't know. I, I would see it as being cost prohibitive if you're spending twenty-five thousand dollars to get elected to a position that pays you thirty-four thousand dollars. Uh, if you do the math, it's not, it doesn't make a lot of sense for that person um, to spend, invest that kind of money. And again, there, there, there's no guarantee. Um, and, and I would say the same thing if, if we, if, uh, if you're looking at full time, um, full time is only full time until you get unelected. And, and, and now you don't have a job. So uh, you have a four year term. So you're spending all this money. Uh, with a guarantee of a job for four years. And at the end of that four years, uh, you could very well be on your own. So I would be very leery of uh, getting a lot of people that would be prepared to run um, unless they, they were in a, a very um, admirable financial position um, to run for a full-time counselor's job. Um, I, I just don't see there being a lineup to do that because it, it's a very unstable uh, employment. So it, uh, it, it, you're at the whim of the public and, and that, can be, uh, that can be finicky. So uh, I like where we are now. I think it works. I, I think it allows everybody to run. Uh, we are part-time, so we meet at night. So people that do work full-time uh, can make the meetings. In fact, uh, we have members, uh, Councillor Weaver, 
uh, works full time and, and puts in a lot of hours at his full time job. And there's times when, um, as a council, we'll make um, we'll make provision uh, for a meeting to allow him to to uh, attend the meeting. Uh, so you can do those kind of things, but it takes a very special individual to, to work your nine or ten hours as he does, and then come back in and work another four or five that night uh, on city business. That again is a tough road to hoe. So I think part time is, is, in my opinion, a good one if it can be kept in the evenings. So I, I like the report. I thank you for the report, and, and I think that the the recommendations that I read are, are all things that I could support. So I appreciate the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Slas. Councillor Wall, second time. Thank you. Um, something somebody said. I wanted to ask about regional councils and if that was in any way privy to this report or is even, what is it, Jermaine? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Sorry, which, what council? A regional council. So I had only recently learned that, that was even a thing, like what happens with Kitchener, Cambridge, Waterloo, I think, and some of there, they have like a municipal council for their city, but then they have this regional council. Right. That yes. So we have like a joint services committee with social services where we vote on, but then it has to be ratified. I'm just wondering, did I miss it in the report or was there just nothing in there about regional councils or that? Well, a couple of things are relevant. First of all, uh, that is a, a structure that it is in place in many parts of Ontario, uh, but it is a different model, if you will, than yours. This is why we talk about single tier municipalities. In those cases, that you're referring to, we'll pick at Waterloo or we could pick Niagara uh, as, as either side of you. Yes, there are two layers of government. There is a, a, a lower tier as it's called, which would be uh, cities, uh, towns, townships that have certain responsibilities. And then there is another level of government above that, the regional government, which has other responsibilities. So it's a, it's a two tier structure. Brantford does not have a two tier structure. Yes, you have shared uh, responsibilities, but is not there is not a second governing body that brings the two parts together. So I mean, that's a starting point. We can pick up some more of that if, if there's further questions. Thank you. Councillor Weaver, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a so councillor Sless, thank you, by the way, <laughs> um, for the nice comments, but um, he, he made me think of, a, of something I've heard of in other cities. Um, so our mayor, or any mayor, but, uh, you know, they, they run and um, if they're not successful, the, the election's over in October, they continue yeah. to run the city until December, and then they're kind of out on their feet. So, right. Um, is there, I, I have heard of some cities having severance packages, small ones to just help like for three months or something to help um, with that transition. Is that a thing or, or am I incorrect in, in um, what I've heard? I have to say that's outside my, my responsibility. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it's not part of what we're looking at here that I know of. And maybe uh, David has some experiences in that. Again, I would think it's a local decision, uh, but I'm not even sure what the rules are around that. Because I, I do see, again, as, as Councillor Sless mentioned, the barriers of, of, of trying to run, yeah. um, you know, particularly I'm part time. I was allowed, you know, thankfully with my full time employer to continue working and, and work after hours. Um, but when you are a full time council person or a mayor, um, you're really all in. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the fact that you're all in that that might limit people's um, desire to maybe come in and and put their foot forward to, to be a mayor in any city, not just ours. Um, I'm very happy with our mayor, by the way, so don't think I'm talking about you, Mr. Councilor, Mayor Davis. But um, so you, you haven't heard of that, uh, any type of severance packages for full-time or, or mayors? I'm, I'm not, not familiar with that, no. No, okay. no I don't. I, we, we have not looked into that as part of this review and I'm not aware of what the practices may be. I know that mayors uh, are able to pay into uh, Omers and, and there are in some cases benefits related to that, but I, I don't know the full picture. I'm sorry now. Okay, well, thank you. Seeing no further questions, I just have one question. Can you go into detail on what phase two of this process will be if, if this is approved tonight? 
Yes, I, I'm happy to jump in on that. I had some notes here about it, and I'll make sure we cover that. Um, yeah, it, phase two is of award boundary review. That assumes that that in your uh, deliberations next week, you you determine that there that members of council will continue to be elected in wards, whether it be two member wards, whether it be one, whether it's five wards or some other number. If you determine there will be wards, phase two will be award boundary review, which is essentially a matter of looking at the wards uh, are around a number of guiding principles, which are set out uh, in, the, in the policy that got us here. Uh, we would need to look at uh, the current wards in the light of, for example, the, the, the population distribution. How has it changed since the current wards were, were developed? How will it look over the next three elections? Because the, the ward boundary review directs us to, to consider wards that would be in place for three elections. And this is where the Watson and Associate uh, part of the team comes into it to provide some of that kind of empirical uh, uh, support for the current system and, and forecast growth to make sure that, that the, the wards meet those expectations over the next three elections. So it, it would be, uh, it's also happening, of course, because uh, and in 2012, 2013, at the last review, council directed that a review would occur after every two elections because as I as I often suggest in these contexts, ward, wards have a limited shelf life. They are drawn up to capture the distribution of population at a given time. And we all know that that changes. Your growth has been pretty su significant. Your territory has expanded, you know growth is coming. So the wards that were created even in 2012 will have a limited lifespan. So we need to step back and say, all right, can we get along with these for another election? Uh, maybe that you can, and you, your decision would be to say, okay, uh, you haven't shown us that we need to change so we could leave it. But if there is some suggestion that a change would be appropriate, you as members of council would then be able to decide, yes, we think we should change or we'll just leave it the way it is. So that's a quick uh, idea. So we, will, we would do a review of the wards around these basic principles to do with population parity, with population growth, with the communities of interest. Uh, the goal is to keep neighborhoods and communities together, uh, not to draw lines through them, to use boundaries that, that are uh, plausible and visible. Those kinds of things would all be part of that review uh, uh, that would follow uh, your decision next week if, again, you decide that, that wards will still be used in Brantford. Did I miss out anything, David? <laughs> Does that answer your question, Chair Martin? Yes, thank you. And uh, oh, second time speaker, Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, Chair Martin. I just would like to uh, ask one question and then uh, then a comment. Uh, to staff, could, could staff uh, answer the question? Uh, what was the budget amount for this for this uh, report program? Uh, through the chair, the budgeted amount was one hundred and fifty thousand for both phases one and two. Thank you for that. And I just, Mr. Chair, I'd like to have a, ask for a division of the question uh, into A and B one, two, and three. Of course, that is, that automatically separates C as well. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That was an excellent report and, and well presented and questions answered uh, thoroughly. So we appreciate that. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, you're very welcome. And with that, the separation has been called for. So if the clerk would call the questions in order, starting with, with A.
through the chair. We're just waiting for Councillor Sless to cast his vote. Not having any luck here. I'm voting uh, in the affirmative. Clause A of item 5.1.1 carries unanimously on recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Celeste, Martin, Antosky, Wall, Weaver, McCreary, Carpenter, and Mayor Davis. Chair Martin. Yes, Councillor Wall. Sorry, question for the clerk's department. When did we put item 5.1 on the floor? I thought we did the presentation, then we had our speaking opportunities after the presentation. When did item 5.1 get put on the floor? At the end of the presentation, uh, we'd run out of time, so there's no opportunity for questions at that point. Okay. At that point, it was put My on the apologies. floor. I believe Councillor Weaver was the mover, and uh, I forget now who the seconder was, but the clerk can remind us if that's necessary. But it is on the floor and, and we've started the voting. So we'll move now to yep. B1. Thank you. Recorded vote on clause B1 carries on a recorded vote of five to four. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Sless, Marn, and Toski, Weaver, McCreary. Those opposed, Councillors Wall, Carpenter, Vanderstelt, and Mayor David. Thank you, and five B, or B2, part-time councillor and full-time mayor employment status. Clause B2 of item 5.1.1 carries on a recorded vote of six to three. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Sless, Marn, and Toski, Weaver, McCreary, Carpenter. Those opposed, Councillors Vanderstelt, Wall, and Mayor Davis. Since Mayor Davis is supposed to be in full time, would you like to move an amendment at this time? Just having a little fun at your expense. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Okay, B3, conduct a council membership of 11 mayor plus two councillors elected for each of the five wards. Clause B3 carries on a recorded vote of six to three. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Sless, Marn, Antosky, McCreary, Weaver, Mayor Davis. Those opposed, Councillors Vanderstelt, Wall, and Carpenter. Okay, that brings us to the last item, C. Oops. And C, okay. Clause C of item 5.1.1 carries on a recorded vote of six to three. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn, and Toski, Weaver, McCreary, those opposed. Councillors Wall, Carpenter, and Mayor Davis. Okay, with that, there are no resolutions and there are no notices of motion for tonight's meeting. So with that, thank you everyone. We are now adjourned. <laughs>